to the United States. We have created, in place of the Democratic Party, an elite liberal technocracy. Somebody like Barack Obama who lectures this, or Ms. Warren, the senator from Massachusetts, lectures us about the evils of the 1% but then have a household income of 1.6 million in her case, or they, they can't vacation without going to Martha's Vineyard. And the idea is that because like the medieval practice of exemption, if you profess that you're hip or cool and you're a participant in popular culture or that you're left wing and progressive, that is sort of like going to a bishop in 16th century Roman saying, you know, I want to donate one block to the Dome of St. Peter's and then it can continue to be a money lender or whatever my particular sin is. It's almost a formal contract. So we have academics today who rail at the corporation, especially the disparity between the CEO and the entry level worker. And yet if you look at the average wage per class of part time teaching, it's gone up about 1% in the last 15 years. Whereas the university presence has gone up about 58%. So we have this ridiculous situation of college presidents at Ohio State, three and a half million dollars, CSU presidents making four and five hundred thousand, railing about inequality in society when they're hiring people, 48% of all units at CSU at three thousand dollar class. That was epitomized most dramatically, as you remember, by Paul Krugman. He recently announced that he was leaving Princeton in his retirement. He would be teaching at the City University of New York, and he would be studying inequality as a Regents right. professor. The only problem was that he was studying inequality as a professor without teaching one class. He was getting $225,000, so he was getting 75 times more salary than the pe people who taught one class there, which was one more class than he taught. It was quite striking. Or Joseph Steiglitz, the great economist who studies inequality, who recently announced that he demands $40,000 a speech. Personally, I can remember that when I was at Cal State Fresno, we had a president who could not write a memo, and I mean this literally, without reminding us that we live in a racially and class and gender diverse society in the Fresno County area and how wonderful that was and how happy was he was to be from the East Coast and get to enjoy this rich cultural milieu, he would say. He did this for 20 years. Every hiring, every policy decision was calibrated in race, class, and gender. And then one day he retired and he announced the next day that he had built a $4 million home in Rancho Mraz and he was leaving. And he's there today. And so what I suggest is that part of the problem with academia, it was a catalyst for the greater problem that we see throughout the Democratic Party and, and the liberal elite that it's almost a psychological mechanism that people adopt hyper-liberalism as a way, whether you're Al Gore and your carbon footprint is astronomical, or you're the Steyer brothers and you rail against private money corrupting things as you infuse 50 million, or whatever the particular sin is, it's a psychological mechanism for a lot of people in academia to make a lot of money, to have a lot of tenure, to have a lot of perks, and not to feel guilty about it because they feel they're on the barricades of social progressive change. So that's one thing that's very disturbing to see these professors talk about granite counters and hardwood floors and the latest Volvo SUV, why they go into the classroom and then tell working kids that they're part of a patriarchy or a white privilege. It doesn't, it doesn't connect anymore. It's almost embarrassing. The second thing that, that I really don't like about the university anymore, and I think you don't either, is that we have reduced history to cardboard caricatures. What do I mean by that? When you say that the Civil War is Harriet Tubman or Rosie the Riveter represents World War II, we say that all those people who died in Okinawa, 12,000 of them, 50,000. Read E.B. Sledge with the old read on Okinawa. They're nothing anymore. Or the tens of thousands of people who came out on the Oregon Trail, they got typhus, they got malaria, they got yellow fever, they endured horrific deprivations to found Oregon and California. They, they don't no longer exist anymore. They're, they're, we go back as if we are picking winners and losers in history, as if it's some melodramatic game, not a tragedy. This guy's good because he's a person of color. She's okay. She's a woman. This guy was a cowboy who we found out was gay. He's okay. And then these are the bad guys. They killed Indians. They desecrated the environment. But what's terrible about it is, first of all, we don't give any 
any latitude for the human experience. They were wonderful people. And second, all, this is all, this process is all occurring in a material and psychological and political context that these people gave us. Nobody wants to go to Angola and do this. Nobody wants to attack the United States from the UN and move the UN to Guatemala. So what I'm saying is these professors are the dividend of thousands of lives, millions of lives of people who sacrificed to do what? To give us the material bounty and the freedom of expression that they count on as second nature. It was brought home to me in a conversation I had around 1995 with a faculty member and said, you have white privilege. I said, no, I don't. And I said, why? I said, well, I had ancestors that came from Sweden. They got off the boat. Well, you have to have some slave owner. I said, well, my maternal grandmother, they had nothing. They took the Intercontinental Railroad. They got into a um, wagon. They found at Fresno the ash tree. They, it wasn't even existing then. They got there in 1871. Two of them died from typhoid. They pitched a tent where my house is today. They had no bathroom, no electricity. There was a pond, and they lived there in a little hovel for, for three years. And then they had a eucalyptus. They, uh, they planted eucalyptus. They had some seeds from Australia. Uh, ten years later, they were using the bark to make another little hovel, and they went hovel to hovel till in 1874, they built the house that I live in. And she said to me, ah, well, where was that grandmother from? And I said, I think from New Mexico. Well, where was she from? Her, I said, well, her father was from Alabama. Oh, so you have slave owners in your family. In other words, you could negate all of that suffering and all of the good that all those generations did because of some abstract concept and an abstract concept that was advanced from somebody who was very wealthy and it depended on all of those values that our ancestors brought, which were what? Constitutional government, free market capitalism, the sanctity of private property. So here we have created this strange thing, this academic that goes to these beautiful campuses such as we're on today, and speaks freely, drives a wonderful car, and then critiques the very system that created all of the things he takes as second nature. And yet worse, to get back to my earlier point about the hypocrisy, the technocracy, never lives out the abstractions that he advances. He's always immune from the ramifications of his own ideology. It's the most crazy thing in the world. Former Chancellor UC Berkeley, who was also a very liberal guy, Robin Bergen, who, who was not disinvited as a, a commencement address, when he arrived in Berkeley, he said, one of my goals is to, to challenge Prop 209 and to make the UC Berkeley camp, campus ethnically diverse. Well, I don't know how a Canadian from Toronto would know about the ethnic diversity of California, but he thought he did. And then I, I wrote an article in critique of him. He, he discovered very quickly that the number of white citizens in California and the number of white citizens at the UC Berkeley campus was disproportionate by about 4%. They were underrepresented. Yes, Chicanos and blacks were underrepresented, but Asians were overrepresented. I don't like those words under, over. Who cares whether Berkeley's 100% Asian if it's meritocratic? So what he was basically telling people, but he was intellectually dishonest, was I want to come here and I want to have some type of quota to, to reduce the number of Asian students so I can mechanically somehow create this diversity, which I will be immune from myself as a white male. He should have resigned and said, there's too many white males, I want a, uh, a black <laughs> chancellor. So that's the second thing that I, I think all of us don't like, that is the hypocrisy and the reduction of individuals in history and tragedies in history to superficial Saturday night melodrama, all orchestrated and directed by a pretty sorry cast of characters in the university. There's a third, and this is a, a pet peeve of mine, and that is military history. History didn't exist apart from military history and its origins. Name any historian of antiquity, Thucydides, Herodotus, Polybius, Livy, Xenophon, Tacitus. History was war because they felt whether it wasn't that they liked war, they no more liked war than brain surgeons like brain tumors. But they studied these pathologies and they thought that there were certain moments in the human experience that for good or evil were more important than other moments. The Battle of Kursk in 1943, in that greatest tank battle of all time, that was a little bit more important each second by second, and it affected a few more million people 
than whether this California legislature was voting on transgendered restrooms. I'm sorry, but every moment in history is not equal. And military history reminds us of that. And that was a way of studying U.S. history, world history, so that when we had this common core and we had this body of professors who were disinterested, we studied military history. So we have the 70th anniversary of D-Day this week. Does anybody believe that American students who graduate know anything about George S. Patton or the Third Army? Do they know why we happened to invade in 1944 and June 6 and not 1942 or not 1945? They have any idea what the strategy about D-Day was about? No. If you ask them what do you know about World War II, they know nothing. They don't know any military history. There are four recognized military history programs in the United States where you can get a, a major, and there's 230 at last count peace and study, peace uh, studies program. Think of that. So the idea is that uh, we can stop war by telling people not to go to war. We've done that for 2,500 years. There's no record that it's ever worked. So what is military history? Really, it's to tell us why people destroy each other in insane fashion, and they do it, unfortunately, toward a general logic. And the logic is when you lose deterrence, when there's a lack of balance of power, when wars are inconsequential, they go on and on, and what causes peace? Basically, peace is a parenthesis, like Plato It's a very said, it's a very rare period in human experience. So what keeps a peace are Armed deterrence, alliances, balance of power. What keeps peace? Uh, defeating the enemy as quickly as possible and not having a bellum interrupt him. But these are the essentials of Western military history, and they've absolutely disappeared from the, the modern curriculum.